Good morning, everyone. I got a chair right here for you. Our emergency preparedness workshop. Um, first of all, I want to thank our weather for cooperating with us for this beautiful morning. And I thank you for showing up today. I am Diana Borges, the Windsor Cope community leader. And our presentation today is going to last about an hour, and then afterwards we're going to be around and help you uh, get prepared for emergencies. We have information, resources, tools for you to take home, and it's going to be great. Um, ask us questions. We're here to help you. I would like to introduce my co-leader for Windsor Cope now, Angelica Nunes. <laughs> My name is Angelica Nunez, and um, I am going to be helping with a little bit of the bilingual translation. So we wanted to ask, um, I'm going to be asking in Spanish, but anyone in Spanish. Buenos días, mi nombre es Angelica, estoy aquí para ayudar con la programa y para traducir a español. Hay alguien que necesita uh, que hagamos la translación en español. Okay. Thank you, Angelica. Okay, so I want to also thank the town of Windsor, our staff, um, Aaron Stroud, who is who is the uh, heads up our uh, senior center here, and then also Nell Herman, who is our recreation manager for organizing this and setting this up for us. Our presenters today, besides myself, is going to be Jim Bogeri from the Sonoma County Fire District, Sergeant James Percy from our Windsor Police Department, <laughs> Nancy Brown from Sonoma County Department of Emergency Management. So I want to start with um, giving you a little introduction on COPE. So COPE stands for Citizens Organized to Prepare for Emergencies. And COPE uh, programs are throughout Sonoma County now. They started in Oakmont uh, with the residents, with help from American Red Cross and the Santa Rosa Fire Department. Uh, COPE is a program that helps neighbors helping neighbors. It's a grassroots effort. So the neighbors join together to prepare themselves, prepare their neighborhood and prepare their properties for emergencies. And it doesn't matter what that emergency is, whether it's wildfires, earthquakes, floods, or any other type of emergency where you might have to evacuate or you might even have to shelter in place and rely on each other. So the COPE program here, uh, we started last year and we have several resources for you. <laughs> Um, if you go to our website, um, we have a business card over um, on that table with the website. There's a lot of links on there to help you get prepared. And one of those is, we have an emergency preparedness guidebook just for Windsor. So if you go there, you can uh, download that. Um, there's also two copies here at the Senior Center and two copies at the library that you can look at. But that document will help you prepare for any of the emergencies that we might encounter here. So the program actually is facilitated by neighborhood leaders. And you might be familiar with the term block captains. Well, it's the same type of thing. That we just call them neighborhood leaders, where they guide 10 to 20 houses. And we are looking for more neighborhood leaders to head up your groups. Um, they act as a liaison between us co-leaders down to your neighborhood team. So they help you prepare and jointly you decide what's going to work for your team. And part of the COPE program is uh, communication dissemination. So Windsor COPE is part of COPE Northern Sonoma County. It's an organized, non-profit organization that is uh, supervised the Gores District. And we have over 45 communities in there right now. Uh, part of that leadership is fire officials that are on there. Um, some of the emergency response organizations and, and also the uh, government agencies are in there. So we, as the leadership for you, get that information and we can pass information down to the neighbors.
neighborhood leaders who in turn pass it down to your neighborhood team. I will give uh, a little bit more information about uh, COPE at the end, and um, I'll also go through what we have for you uh, after the other speakers. So right now, I would like to pass the mic over to Jim. Good morning. Can everybody in the back hear me? No. We're good? <laughs> no, hey. Um, so Diane asked me here today to talk to you about home hardening and different communication sites and apps that you can look at that will give you information, uh, not only during fire season, but during the rainy season with, with the big storm we just had. Uh, there's a lot of information out there that you have access to, whether it be on your computer, your smartphones, things of that nature that kind of keep you up to date on current, current activities and what's going on. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about was home hardening. Now, I realize that we're all thinking fire season is over and the worst of it's over. One of the things that we find out is people wait till the last minute to start clearing up around their house. You know, June, July comes along, things get hot, we start seeing fires popping up on the news, and then everybody panics, and everybody's in a big rush to get the clearing done around their house. What we would like to see people do is do that throughout the year. Do some of the smaller projects. That way we're not overwhelmed with having to do a lot of vegetation management around the house. Um, specifically, with home hardening, this is, this is really one of the key points in the fire service that we're really trying to stress to homeowners is um, hardening your home. Have your home prepared in the event of a large-scale wildfire, like we saw the Kincaid fire that came into Windsor, uh, to have your home set up where it will almost defend itself. Uh, when these large fires come through, we don't have the resources available to be at everybody's home. So the better prepared you are based on what you've done around your house, the better the survivability is for your homes. So some of the things we're going to talk about, we talked about the immediate zone. The immediate zone is the zero to five feet off of your home. So what we like to see is uh, basically a hardscape five feet off your home. And I know a lot of people say, oh my God, it's, it's not very attractive, it doesn't look good, but believe it or not, it, uh, it really is one, it's probably one of the, the, the target areas where we lose most of our homes. People who put uh, bark, gorilla hair, uh, brush, trees, right up against our homes. What we're finding is when we have, especially in these fires with the big heavy winds, what's getting us is what we call the ember cast. It's not really the main fire that's getting us, it's the embers coming off the main fire. These embers can travel a mile, a mile and a half away from the main body of the fire. And when they get spread out, they're everywhere. We as firefighters, you can only do so much to stand by and protect your home, but when we have thousands of homes in the town that we need to be on top of and protect, we want to be sure that your home is set up and prepared in the event that these embers do come through, that we're not going to have a small little bush, brush, or uh, some sort of kind of organic material that's going to be receptive to these embers to get going and all of a sudden it gets right into your home. So what we're looking at is uh, zero to five feet. So five feet off your home, we'd like to see Hardscape. Get rid of that bark. Get rid of that. They call gorilla hair. Uh, get those plants away from your home. Replace it with gravel, concrete, uh, decomposed granite, any kind of non-flammable material around your property uh, is really key. It's probably one of the number one things that you can do to protect your home. Um, it reduces the vulnerability from the embers. Um, a brick walkway is another one that people can look at. Um, I'm going to kind of run down our list here. So we'll start with, with the roots. Uh, shingles. Obviously, we don't see a whole lot of wood shake anymore in California. It's banned. Some of the older homes, there is wood shake. Uh, that's a, that's a, a big problem that we have uh, in some of our older homes. Uh, probably not so much in Windsor because Windsor is a newer community. But in some of our older homes, wood shake homes, wood uh, shake siding on homes, very flammable. You figure years and years of drying out in the sun. It's really, really becoming a good tinder for the embers to get up under and get your rooftops going. Um, clean, cleaning the debris off your rooftop, rooftops, your gutters. Even now, with, with the rainy season coming, we've been hit hard and fast so far. Be sure your gutters are clean. One, for water damage for this time of year, but two, because it's another receptive fuel vent. The leaves build up, pine needles, things of that nature in your gutters are receptive fuel beds for, the, for this ember cast to get in there and get your rooftops going. Uh, your eaves, 
So current uh, regulations now, they want to see uh, the openings in your eaves with uh, metal flashing. So we all have the vents, kind of hard to see here, the vents under the eaves of our rooftops. Uh, if, if the eaves aren't closed, you have metal screening there. What they're finding is that the old metal screening, the diameter was too big, that the embers were getting up into, into through this, uh, the eaves, through the screens, and getting your roofs going. We as firefighters are not gonna be able to see that because when we come to pretend, uh, protect your house, we're coming in quickly, we're doing a, a, what we call a quick hot lap, make sure there's no open fires outside of the house, and then we're moving on to the next house. We've actually found houses two, three days after the fact that we've been there, we come back, and the house has been burned to the ground because the embers have gotten in there, and we weren't able to see that. So what, they, what the manufacturers are coming out with now uh, are products where the openings in the eaves are less than one eighth of an inch in diameter. That's preventing these larger embers from being able to get up into, into the attic space into your home. Same goes for the, uh, the vents down below under your house. We, we need those to keep the moisture out, but once again, we also want that smaller diameter, which is still gonna allow for the airflow to go through to keep the moisture out, but it's also gonna prevent the eaves, or I'm sorry, from the embers getting up underneath your house. Once again, going back to the vegetation around your house, that's one of the problems we have is we'll have these small plants right up against the, uh, the vents under your house. The plant gets going, creeps right up underneath through the vent and then the flooring of your house. And as you know, we've got a full work of structural fire. Um, siding is another one. So a lot, of, all the new construction now with siding is coming out with fire resistance. And we're, we're calling it hardy board, but it's more of a concrete siding. It looks like wood, but they're, they're getting away from using wood products for siding now. Um, probably not something that we can all afford to do. It's very expensive. Uh, if you are in a position of rebuilding, remodeling, things of that nature, uh, you definitely want to look at this fire resistive siding that, uh, that is coming out on the market. One more way of protecting your home. Um, I don't know how it works as far as cost wise, but once again, if we're talking about the value of our home, uh, sometimes we spend a little bit more for that little bit of insurance policy. Um, skylights, glass, plastic, once again, they can fail in heavy heat. Um, you know, plastic melts, obviously, in heavy heat. That's not so much a concern with uh, the ember cast as it is with the main body of the fire coming. Quite frankly, if our skylights and glass, uh, plastic and glass skylights are failing, Typically, we have bigger problems than just the skylight. If they're failing, it's because there's quite a bit of heat there. There's not much we're going to be able to do in that case. Um, windows. We want to be sure that everybody has double pane windows in their house. That extra bit of insulation is enough to keep the radiant heat out from getting inside your house, getting your curtains going, things of that nature. Um, and then decks. Decks are a real problem for us in the fire service. Decks are collection points for embers, typically always on the back of the house. What we'll have is when uh, these ember casts come through, they will get up underneath the deck. Who doesn't store a lot of their materials under the deck? We all do. Lumber, what have you, yard tools, whatever. We want to keep those decks clear. We want to be sure that we don't have any kind of flammable material under the decks. Um, in the fire service, I've gone to large scale fires where we have a lot going on and we're moving fast. We will literally come up with chainsaws and we will cut the deck completely off the house and drop the deck away from the house because the deck is such a problem for us as far as the house getting going and the embers getting underneath, it's easier for you to go to your insurance company and say, well, the firefighters cut our deck away, but if they saved the home, the insurance company would much rather pay for the cost of a new deck than you would for a new home with a new deck. So something to consider if you do have decking at home, uh, be sure that it's clear, uh, you don't have anything underneath it. Once again, when we talk about the pine needles and things of that, keep your decks clear and make sure there's no dry, dead vegetation sitting on top of your deck. It's not collecting underneath your deck. Um, these are these are real concerns for us. Um, garages, garages are another issue for us. Uh, so we, we when we talk about the five feet, the five foot or the immediate zone, uh, that includes your garages. Any kind of building, that you, any structure that you have on your property, you want to have that five foot defense, that five foot barrier around those structures, uh, including garages because the same will happen with your garages, your sheds, any outbuildings that you have. Uh, if you still have vegetation that's next to it or on the ground on the ground level, that those are things that are going to, uh, they're very receptive fuel beds for the embers and those are things that you're gonna wanna have removed. Replace it with gravel, I say keep it with granite, whatever you 
have or something that's non-flammable, and it's going to give your structures, your home, a much better chance of survivability in the event that we can't be there. Um, I'm trying to kind of cut it close because we do have a timeline here. Um, chimneys are another one, especially this time of year. And this is this is fireplace burning season for us. As soon as it gets cold, everybody lights off their fireplaces. Well, you get build up every year. You get the creosote build up. Um, you get the carbon build up, and next you know we have we're going to chimney fires nonstop. Very very common. We recommend annually that you bring in a chimney sweep. Have your chimneys cleaned cleaned out completely and make sure that every year that's done. Uh, smoke alarms, another one, it's, you know, especially this time of year, this is really a time of year that we start ramping up and we, we see a lot more structure fires this time of year because of people burning candles, uh, heaters, portable heaters in the house, look at the, you know, material gets put up against it or we have curtains, they get knocked over, whatever the reason is, this, like I say, this time of year um, is a very busy time of year for us for structure fires. So things to, to be aware of. Fences are another one. So a lot of us, we all have yards with fences. What we're recommending is, well, what we're seeing is um, a lot of these wooden fences, once again, with the ember cast, are becoming receptive fuel beds for fire. We're seeing a lot of the times where the embers are getting up underneath the fences, the fence gets going and it's just like a fuse. It'll run the whole fence right up against your house and next thing you know, your house is going and it came from the fence in your backyard. What we recommend is that uh, it doesn't have to be the whole fence, but maybe that five, 10 foot break between your wooden fence and your structure, have it metal. Um, a lot of people are using what they call the hog wire fencing, where it might be a wood frame, but the whole fence is metal, it's helping out. Anything you can do to keep that wood fence from running up against the side of your home is just another insurance policy for all of you. The other thing we want to talk about is communication and apps. So one of the things a lot of people use to kind of stay in contact with what's going on are these apps that are out there and these websites that are out there. There's a lot of information for you that you can keep track when we have these big fires or this flooding or these big events. Uh, instead of calling 911 or your local fire station or police department to find out what's going on, there's a lot of information out there for all of you. Uh, SoCo Alert, first of all, is one of, one of the best apps out there. It's directly related to Sonoma County. Um, it's a free emergency notification system. Um, you have to you have, you have to register online. So there, there is a number and when we're done, if you come meet me at the table, uh, I actually have a list of all of these different uh, apps and websites that you can go to that you can download and keep track of yourself. Um, it will notify you of dangerous conditions or immediate threat to personal safety i.e. when we're talking about evacuations and things of that nature and Sheriff James will talk more about evacuation, uh, the evacuation zones for the town of Windsor um, and when we talk about the evac packs, there's a lot of information there so I won't go too much into it but that's the nice part about these, these apps and these websites is that they're giving you the information, they're giving you, uh, they're letting you know what, what zone are you, what's your evacuation zone, uh, when is it time to get out, it's giving you up to date current, current information. Uh, Nixel is another one. I know a lot of people, we, we just put out, along with the Sheriff's Department, I think most of public safety just put out uh, messages across social media. We get a lot of calls when there's a fire anywhere in the county, we get a lot of calls, why didn't I get a Nixel? Why, why wasn't I alerted about this? So when we use a Nixel, we really want to be sure that we're using it specifically for um, larger scale events, events that are truly going to impact you as a homeowner, um, if we find that if we overuse it, we do it too much, then people tune us out. So if you didn't get a Nixel, typically it's because it's not affecting you. It's, it's a fire or an event that's away from where you live, um, and it's not something that you really need to be concerned about. That's not to say that you can't find the information out there elsewhere. Um, like I say, there's a lot of people um, with the Nixel system uh, that want to know why, why did I get it? And that's what we're trying to explain is you're not gonna get a Nixel for every event that we have to read between us and law enforcement, if we send an Nixle for every call that we went on, you turn it off. You, you wouldn't even want to listen to us anymore because we're busier than you think we are and it's a lot of it's just mundane, you don't need to know kind of stuff. But if you are getting a Nixle, it's because it is a bigger event. It is something that's going to affect you. Uh, they do it through geolocating, so typically there'll be a geographical area. If there is an event, there's a fire in town, they'll pick a geographical radius 
and on and I can send a nixel out to those people. They'll be the closest affected by that event. It'll give you the information, whether it be an evacuation or what the current status is of the incident, and that way it's keeping everybody informed of what's going on. Uh, Pulse Point is another one. It, that's a, a national app that's out there. Uh, it doesn't give a lot of information on Pulse Point, but it will tell you what the event is. It'll tell you where the event is. Uh, basic details, but there's not, there's not a whole lot with Pulse Point. Uh, I find a lot of people are going away from Pulse Point. Um, the new, the big one that's out now is called Watch Duty. And as I said, you don't, you don't walk, need to watch, write these down right now. I will have uh, pages that you can take home with all of these apps and the websites and the information on how to sign up for Nixle and social emergency and things of that nature. Uh, but Watch Duty, Watch Duty is good and bad. So the thing with Watch Duty is, it's a private group, some firefighters, law enforcement, it's kind of a mishmash of people who have some relation to public safety. What they're doing is they're listening to the scanners and they actually all work shifts. So they're listening to the scanners when events come, specifically fires, and it's really targeted towards Sonoma County. Um, when fires come, they're listening to the scanner and they're posting where the, where the fire is at. They're listening to the information, whatever's coming across the radio is what they're putting out to the public. So if you want to know real-time information on what's going on with specific incidents, Watch Duty is, is a great one right now um, because it is giving you current, up-to-date information. Now, I will say one of, the, one of the problems we're having with that is sometimes they're putting out information that we don't necessarily want the public to know. If it's a potential crime scene, maybe an arson investigation, sometimes we, there's information for investigative reasons that we don't want to convey. If there's fatalities, things of that nature, we don't want that out there. It's out of common courtesy with the family, we want to be sure that we notify family before the public knows that hey, we've had a fatality at the scene. Uh, so we really, we're really trying to work with them to make sure that they're not putting out too much information out of the shoot, waiting and trying to be respectful uh, for other people. Alert Wildfire. Alert Wildfire is a wonderful, wonderful site. For those of you who haven't heard of it, these are the wildfire cameras that all, well, they're all over. Sonoma County, but they're in other counties too, Marin, Solano, I believe, where are we at? So uh, in the North Bay alone, there's 86 cameras that are constantly going 24-7. If there's a fire in the area, if you go to Alert Wildfire, you can find out, if you find out where that area is, you can click right on the camera and watch live time what that fire is doing. You'll, you'll watch a live feed. Uh, that way it gives you a better understanding, oh, this is supposed to be, Maybe I need to start thinking about evacuating. Maybe it's time, you know, if this thing keeps moving the way it is, we're gonna have to get out of here. So it's allowing you to kind of prepare yourself mentally, um, making sure your go bags are ready. Maybe it's time to throw your go bags in the car, turn your cars around, have them facing out, and be sure that you're absolutely ready to go. Um, and that's a big one. And then one of the other things we talked about was air monitoring. Uh, there are two sites, Purple Air and IQ Air, that do constant air monitoring. So if we're concerned, especially when the fires come through, we've, we've seen it for several years that we've just been banked down in smoke and it makes it very difficult for all of us to breathe. Uh, those of you who might have some respiratory issues, it's probably best when you get to a certain point when you go to these sites, that it's time to leave. It's time, time to get out of the area because it's gonna stay for a while and it's really, it affects all of us. So we, like I say, we wanna be sure to try to provide you with as much information as we can and that way, um, you're well informed on your own, be it your computers, your smartphones, um, with Nixle. Nixle you have to sign up for. Nixel, they can you can set it up where they will call you and send you the Nixle alert. If it's, if it's broadcast, your phone will ring, it'll tell you what the Nixle alert is, and that gives you an, uh, an understanding of what to do. Uh, James will go more into uh, evacuation, evacuation zones and things of that nature, so I won't, I won't go into that. Um, but that's what I have for you right now. As I said, when we're done, I also brought a bunch of NOAA radios. Uh, we can discuss that a little bit too. For those of you who might be hard of hearing or if you have family members of hard of hearing, we have boxes that have strobe lights and bed shakers uh, that connect to the NOAA radio. So the event of the NOAA radio sets off and it'll tell you if there's an evacuation warning, an evacuation order, uh, strobe light and the bed shakers will act as well. And that way, if you can't audibly hear it, it gives you it gives you a heads up and lets you know hey there's something going on and there is a display on the screen uh, where it'll tell you what what's what's going on. Okay.
But all I have, I'm going to introduce James Percy from the town of Windsor Police. Good morning. Up here with me today is also Sergeant Juan Valencia with the uh, Sonoma County Sheriff's Office. Can everybody hear me back there? No. Okay. Uh, those of you that don't know, the Town of Windsor Police Department is uh, a contract city for the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office. So it's uh, a small, we're basically a smaller group within the Sheriff's Office. And we work closely, um, especially under emergency situations, under kind of what we use as kind of the mothership of, of the Sheriff's <laughs> Office. Sergeant Juan Valencia is a PIO uh, with the Sheriff's Office who's responsible for a lot of the emergency alerts and we'll get into that for the end of my presentation to you. So as we all know, the um, weather has changed, the fires, specifically with fires since uh, 2017 when we experienced the Tubbs fire and then followed up in 2019 by the Kincaid fire. The, the issues that we faced with both fires, we can start with the Tubbs fire in regards to how fast moving it was. And when it occurred, you know, we hadn't seen anything like this in Sonoma County. So when it came over the mountain, the emergency personnel was basically overwhelmed um, with trying to evacuate folks. At the same time, trying to, you know, create a defensible space, you know, with fire. So law enforcement, particularly, you know, in our agency, whether it's Windsor Police, the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office, we work very close with the fire department when these disasters occur because we each have different responsibilities. Um, generally speaking, when a large scale event with specific, you know, a fire, it could be an earthquake, flood, or anything of that nature, it's we get tasked really quick with one, it's either we have to fight off the fire, which fire would do, and then in law enforcement, we have to begin the evacuations and start mobilizing certain areas. One of the big issues that we faced over the years is the geographic area of Sonoma County and the municipal districts like the town of Windsor that are within it. So we had not really had a formulated evacuation style mapping plan. A lot of the you know, state of California was kind of behind that in that it had, hadn't really been an issue, you know, like maybe some other states back east with tornadoes and so forth. But since we've learned a lot from these fires in that there's things that we can put in place to mobilize a lot of the residents you guys saw in 2019 when we evacuated a large portion of Sonoma County. You know, again, working closely with fire and the National Weather Service, there's predictions that come out on, you know, wind, the, you know, the weather, you know, burning rates. So when you forecast evacuations, you, there's a lot that goes into it. For example, there was a lot of questions that came up, why did we evacuate such in large areas? Well, a big part of the evacuations is the roadway system and the direction that the fire's moving. So we have to kind of look further down the road, so to speak, in that how are we going to get folks out if, if this danger, such as a fire, is moving. So kind of pare this down, uh, Sonoma County has basically created zones for every part of it to include the municipal cities, you know, within, such as Windsor. What we've done in Windsor is we've basically made, and I'll show you guys, um, there's some maps back at our pop-up set back here. We broke it down into the four zones. So we basically put the, the whole town into quadrants. I know this is a small piece of paper, but they're, they're basically color coded. The top of the map being the northern part of Windsor. So in the quadrants, we have a zone A, which would be the northwest side of Windsor. Zone B would be the northeast side, which is up by Foothill Park to give you a reference point. Zone you know, C is WIC, the WI is Windsor and is kind of the area up off of um, like Airport Boulevard, up that area. And then across the freeway is WID. So those are the primary zones that we've established for the town of Windsor, A, B, C, D. So when you see the WI in front of it, that's for Windsor. 